Kalubia. Yes. I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah, Kalubia. As always, we have to start at the beginning. So, Kel, where are you born and raised? Uh, I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. That's where I grew up playing tennis, you know, since I was like five. My dad used to bring me out and let me hit some balls with him, and I loved that. We were watching a commercial, and it was these young kids playing tennis. And I said to him, I said, oh, would you like to do it? He said, yes, mom. Kel is that guy you want on your team. He can play tennis, can play basketball. He's like the jack of all trades with sports. Kel is a great athlete. And beyond that, Kel is just a great person. He made lots of friends, not only because of his athletic prowess, just because of his personality. You know, Kel was always bigger than life, right? He'd come in with his Suburban, with his like big speakers and blast <laughs> it through the parking lot. Now tell me about Kel as a young tennis player. What was this player like? Were you a little slice and dice? What was your game like? Uh, um, I was known for having a big serve and a big four. And you started playing tournaments quite young? Yeah, so in the 14s, you know, I was top five in the state. And then I got up to like top 10 in the, in the country. What is it about the sport of tennis that made you love it more than the others? I don't know, it's just something about tennis, you know? It's just you against the other person. You can't depend on other teammates. You can't depend on anyone to achieve what you want to achieve. So it's up to you if you want to be great or not. After a few injury-riddled seasons at Purdue University, Kel finished up his collegiate career at TCU. Upon graduation, Kel joined his family business, which involved lots of long-distance travel back and forth between Houston and Nigeria. Tell me a little bit about what it's like in Nigeria. Oh, man, it's, it's a completely different lifestyle. You know, you have to deal with like, the corruption. The local government will make your life hell unless you unless you take care of them. What's going through your head? Because you're, you're used to such a sort of free-spirited time in the States and the way you grew up. How, how difficult of an adjustment was that? I, I was so used to, you know, this life, especially with me being from America. You know, you can't just, you can't just walk it out anyhow. You, know, you have to be very careful where you go. My dad used to tell me, you know, don't leave the compound unless you have to. I was not comfortable with it as a mom. Sure. When he was there, I would try to speak to him every day, every day. And even when what happened to him, it was on a Wednesday, it was hard to accept because I knew I had spoken to him that night. Can you walk us through a little bit what happened that evening? Yeah, so I just closed from work that day, called my mom to check on her and see, to see how she's doing. 20 minutes later, I started hearing some loud bangs at the door. Um, at first, you no, know, I thought it was my security because sometimes they'll come and check on me. Um, but these bangs were different, you know, these like my hard bangs. Once I knew like, okay, someone's trying to get in. I got my phone, I ran back to the back of the house and I called you know, um, the police, people I know, that usually escort me when I need to go. So I kept calling and calling, but it's, the line was busy. I just came back in the in the sitting room, they were banging, the, the, loud, the bangs were getting louder and louder. All of a sudden, they kicked the door in, and about four, about four or five of them entered. And four or five of them? Yeah, and one was holding a rifle. Um, and he said words to me that I'll never forget. He, he pointed the gun at me, he's like, you know you're going to die tonight, right? I got down on the ground, on hands and my knees. I closed my eyes. I thought, OK, I'm never going to see my, my mom again. I'm never going to see my dad again. I'm never going to see my sister again. I'm never going to see my friends again, because I thought they were going to blow my brains out. And that's the last thing I remember. I didn't know this at the time. But I, I ended up having emergency brain surgery, and then I was in a coma for six days. My skull was fractured. Who knows how many times they hit me in the head? They stabbed me on my side. Um, they knocked my they, my they knocked they, they, they knocked my teeth out. You woke up, and you you saw your family when you came out of the coma. Were you able to communicate with them? No, I couldn't communicate. No, uh, I still I still couldn't speak. All I, all I could do was um, was look at them. You were able to think and process thoughts at that time? Yeah, I was able to think and process. You know, I was like, <laughs> in my head, you know, I knew what was going on, but I just couldn't, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't say anything. 
At first, no, I didn't know what was wrong with me. No, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about a brain injury. I didn't know anything. I thought, okay, this, I'll, in a month or so, I'll, I'll get back. To, I'll, I'll go back to normal. Like, I'll, I'll, I didn't know why my hand wasn't working. I didn't know why my leg wasn't working. I, I didn't know anything. After going through the unimaginable in Nigeria, Kel arrived back here in Houston to undergo his fourth brain surgery. And after that, well, he had to start from scratch. He had to learn to walk, talk, and read all over again. I was completely paralyzed on my right side. I say it took me about a couple of years to train my brain to know that, okay, your right side doesn't work anymore. So now the left side has to do everything. To be honest, in the beginning, he was probably the toughest patient I had. Had a helmet on, was in a wheelchair, and his goals were pretty big. He wanted out of the wheelchair, he wanted out of the, uh, the helmet. And to really get the body to actually wake up, we need what we call neuroplasticity. And that's the brain creating a new way to get the job done. It was like a baby wanting to walk in. I had to stand first. That was a frustrating thing. Like, okay, I know I should be able to do this. Why can't I do this? Oh, it's because you're brain. He's strong. He pushes. He pushes. That is why he's where he is now. His 30 plus years of being a competitor, especially on the tennis court, is what gave him this mental drive and this physical drive to go at it at 110%. Never forget, it's a couple of days before I was discharged where they had me walk on my own and everyone on the floor was clapping. I'm always challenging myself every day because that's the only way you're gonna get better. Once you start to get the body better, how do you continue to improve the body, but at the same time, work on the mind and the soul? Well, welcome to the Iron Jungle. I met a competition from tennis. I want to do something that will allow me to be competitive because I never thought I would be able to do anything um, competitive again. We found a couple of shows in 2020. I competed in two categories, the adaptive category, which is people with disabilities, limitations, but I also competed against the regular category with other healthy, able bodybuilders. And to my surprise, I got second. <laughs> <laughs> Once I saw how I looked in that show, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm locked in. So I, went, I trained even harder in 2021, and that's the show I ended up winning. Incredible. I was on my, my pro card. From you picking up the sport to earning a pro card within two years. Yeah, to this day, I, I, I still can't believe it. You know, I'm a, I'm a pro bodybuilder. People don't realize, like, in, in bodybuilding, it's all about symmetry. And, like, you know, you look from the back, you know, you got such a good V-shape going right now. I don't think they realize how difficult it is to achieve what you've done. Yeah. Sometimes now, my therapist, don't forget which side was That's in. crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> what does bodybuilding mean to you? In a way, I don't feel like I can relate to a lot of people because they're, they're not dealing with the issues that I'm dealing with. But when I go to the gym, it gives me another way to kind of relate to people. Yeah! You say you want to do it big. You're speaking like an absolute champion, and that's exactly what you are, not just of bodybuilding, but of life. And a lot of people are inspired by that, including your high school. They named a hill after you. It means so much to me that they will want to name the hill after me. Uh, to this day, I'm so speechless. Kel's story is inspirational for generations. He's shown everybody how hard work and faith and friendship and family can really make a tremendous impact. And it's just a story everybody should hear. After focusing on his own recovery for so long, Kel felt the time was right to begin helping others. So he created the Kel Strong Foundation, a nonprofit group focused on financially supporting traumatic brain injury survivors like himself. How different is the Kel that I'm lucky enough to be sitting in front of right now to the Kel from before the incident? Back then, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know my purpose. Now, I definitely know what my purpose is, just to help as many people as I can. Because, you know, the fact that I survived, why I survived, you know, it means that God is not done with me. I want to make sure I want to fulfill his plans.